without further ado, I'm Marcus Jimenez. Uh, like I had mentioned, I've spent about uh, close to 20 years in advertising and marketing as a creative director and primarily more than half of that career focusing on the Hispanic and multicultural markets. Um, my born and raised out in New York, I came out to Colorado about 20 years ago to head up the Coors Light business. Um, and Vanessa and I crossed paths many moons ago uh, when I actually ventured out to become a founder and become an entrepreneur myself. So I've been, as of last week, I celebrated 10 years of being an entrepreneur. So, uh, yeah, I haven't looked back since. Um, I am a bit batshit crazy, and you can ask that guy there. He'll tell you that I kind of am. But, uh, uh, but it's been an incredible and enjoyous ride, um, which has been fantastic. So, um, but without further ado, Let's get into what identity as a business is all about. We're going to dive into a lot of discussion around what identity you know, is and across different markets. We're going to have a great discussion around that impact on branding. So if you're a founder and you're here to understand um, not only how identity can be the basis for a business model and a successful one at that, um, it'll also give you a lot of nuggets of insight around um, its implication on branding and how you actually can manifest a sense of identity of your startup and actually translate that into something what we define as cultural branding and looking at a point of being able to um, articulate authenticity, right, which is really what you need to be able to differentiate in a marketplace and find success. Okay? So without further ado, this is Vanessa Verheel. Can you just, you know, give them a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thanks, Marcus. Uh, so I'm Vanessa Vigil. I am the chief brand officer for Me Too, uh, now recently merged with NGL, so NGL Me Too. Um, so I've been also in the advertising industry for 20 years, right out of college, um, and always at the intersection of entertainment and media and uh, Latino culture, right? And so um, I've find myself very, very fortunate to have always sort of been able to merge those worlds. Being in LA, um, working on entertainment accounts is very, very common on the agency side. Um, obviously, a lot of you know big agencies are in New York. They have a big variety of accounts in LA. Uh, entertainment dominates, and so that's always been my background. Um, and yeah, I was always agency side on the media teams, um, so working with the investment teams and strategy. Um, I started at a small, Hispanic agency called Arenas Entertainment, which handled a variety of marketing disciplines. Um, at that time, we worked on Universal Pictures and a lot of the studio accounts. I then branched off and joined my boss from that agency when she started her own agency. Um, so kind of got a taste of the startup secondhand. It wasn't my company, but I got a taste of it with her. Um, I joined her there for several years, and then I went over to Omnicom to work on the Disney business. So I was um, the head of multicultural strategy for the media team there. Um, went back Back to work on Universal Account, again, on the agency side for a bit. Before I got a chance to come over to Meet Thu, I always just really loved um, what the company stood for, and I felt like they just had a real authenticity, and so I was always kind of had my eye on it and trying to make the jump over, so I got the chance in 2019 to come join Meet Thu um, to lead all of their brand strategy, which really means responding to a ton of RFPs. <laughs> um, so I got sort of to sit on the other side of the table after many, many years of being on the agency side. Side, so. so for, I think, this half of the class, you probably know what Me Too is. Um, you guys are familiar with Me Too? Any, any of the youngins? Yeah, I think some of you might know. It's this half of the class that's probably like, oh, hold on, exactly, there we go. Yeah, exactly, not everybody's too old. Um, but it's fantastic. Rather than describe it up front, we're going to give you guys a quick little video. I think if you guys look ahead, up above, you'll, hopefully this thing will work. Um, and you'll have it, we're going to play a little bit of a clip that describes what Me Too is, and then we're going to dive into that discussion, OK? Oop. See, and like I thought, it doesn't play. Hold on. We're trying. <laughs> no, not loading. Give me one second. Is Chris here? Hey, Chris. It's, so jump back out. Give me one second. I'm going to run this. So I'll get it set when you get to the side. I'll get it set for you, just in case it bounces out. Because oh. we were having a problem with this. It jumps it out versus going down. So, so. <laughs> so 
So describe for the audience exactly what Me Too is. Let's start there. Okay, so Me Too is a digital media and entertainment company. It's now, it turns 10 years old this year. Um, so primarily it exists on social, YouTube. Uh, it originally started as an MCN on YouTube. It evolved into, um, you know, the founders really starting to develop its own voice and becoming its own brand. So if you think of a publisher like BuzzFeed or Complex or Vice, that's pretty much what we do, but all focused on the Latino market. Um, and more so than that, focused on that US Latino perspective, right? Because that's a very different experience than, let's say, what we all saw growing up on Univision or Telemundo. Like, that is content coming from other countries. Um, Me Too really carved its niche in representing the US Latino perspective. And so, you know, those of us that were probably born and raised in this country or came very, very young. Um, and so are fully Americanized, but also still very, very tied to our culture and um, living that 200% duality and really embracing it. So that's what we do. And who founded Me Do originally? So the founder was Beatriz uh, Acevedo, she uh, and her husband, and then they brought on a third uh, founder, Roy Burston. So the three of them were the original co-founders. Um, of the company, she you know comes from a production background, but she's also just a force <laughs> and an entrepreneur. She now uh, started a, a different company called Suma Wealth, which is again still dedicated to financial education and empowerment for the Latino community. So she has always, always been in service of the community. Um, and so yeah, she was the original founder and stayed on, I believe, until 2018. Yeah, so I'd like to mention that because I think, number one, it's she's not only female, but it's also a Latina that founded a, a large and significant platform that's driving culture. And so I think that, you know, it's, it's one of those pieces that we always like to highlight, um, at least whenever I, I do mention yeah. Me Too. But who owns Me Too today, just so that... Yeah, we so now we are owned by uh, Go Digital Media Group. So they have a, their background is more in music, IP, licensing. Um, they have a label called Sync Music, and they've made many acquisitions um, over the years. So they acquired us. Um, fun fact, they signed for us like March 7th of 2020. So, um, you know, not much was happening in the world then. We kind of immediately went into shutdown. There was so much happening at, at that time. Um, it just sort of added to the tumult of, you know, being acquired. Uh, but they are actually, they're a really good business group. They have three principal divisions, music, networks, which is where Me Too exists, um, and commerce is the, the last pillar that they're really looking to stand up. They recently acquired Eastern Mountain Sports and Bob's. Um, they also own Yoga Works, um, and then they still have a really robust music division that's kind of the bread and the butter. So um, here's, at this point, we're, so you get a little bit of a taste of what Me Too really does um, and driving brand, which is really where we're going to drive part of this conversation. So we'll start by sort of splintering out and, and breaking down a little bit of um, not only what identity, um, not really what it means, but its impact on being able to drive branding, right, and drive cultural branding. Um, and we're going to dive into that. One of the hardest things to do is that it's, and one of the biggest questions that I think a lot of marketers, a lot of brands have, is how exactly do you get from driving or having, you know, picking self-identity within a consumer base, but how does that translate into actual brand and communication, content creation? So if you think of you having an audience and as you're doing as a founder, you're probably driving and developing customer journeys, right? And doing journey maps and trying to figure out who exactly is engaging maybe with your product, et cetera. Well, how do you translate that into something motivational for them, right? And influence their ability to either purchase or engage with the brand that you're trying to promote. So who, the big question is, let's start with, what is the impact that identity has on driving cultural branding in your experience? Well, I think it's it's a resonance more than anything. So, you know, I mean, again, we've both been in the industry for 20 years. And so you've been through the kind of the total market approach. Yes, you can reach people through targeting. Uh, but really, I think the difference comes when you create content that, you know, people just feel like, 
they get me, they they see me, and and that there's something deeper. You know, it's more nuanced than just casting someone that looks multicultural. It's really you know those inside jokes, and that that's you know where we've seen so much of our success with brand partners is. Um, you know, so memes is like a very signature thing that Mithu does, has always done, and it's just really fun, and um, it works really well for entertainment clients. And like, all we do is just take a little clip, and but some of those just the jokes that we can make that Mithu can make, but that brand couldn't, right? It'd be really awkward for like Sony Pictures to make a cultural joke; it just wouldn't land right. But but it, when it's coming from Mithu, because it's coming from an insider perspective, um, the engagement is just incredible, and like we can just. You know, again, it's also very much a Latino cultural thing that like we make fun of ourselves, we like laugh, we just, you know, so I think it's just that nuance, like that makes the difference of feeling like they're not just talking at you and trying to get into your pockets, but like, okay, they actually took the time to understand what we're about and kind of all of us, right? And celebrate like all those nuances and, and everything that comes with culture, which again, you, you can't fake that. Like, you can't just solve that in casting. You can't just solve that by targeting someone based on data, you know, from something they bought six months ago or whatever. It's not that simple. So I'm curious, in the audience, how many of you are either founders or aspiring founders of a company? So almost fully. And you guys are all aspiring over on this side, right? So um, What's really interesting is, and I think what you're breaking down is is a key point here in that when we talk, when people always talk about driving authenticity, right, with the product or brand that you're trying to launch, that's exactly what we're trying to get at, is that it's not about driving just the commerce, but it, the true value of what you're really doing and what, you're, what the whole mission of what your product ought to be or what your brand is, is really about driving true value and coming from a point of understanding. Right, so commerce is actually the transaction at the end of that, of that moment. It's not at the beginning. And so I'd, I would encourage you, like as founders, as you start to think about your products or you start to think about your brand, is really hone in on the part of the, the value and the mission component, which is all about what is the value that you, how are you enriching someone's life after they bought your product? If you focus on that first, then selling actually becomes a hell of a lot easier mm -hmm. after that. So that's one big nugget that I just wanted to kind of highlight. Um, yeah, and I think if I can add, I mean, you know, I think as marketers a lot of times or as business people, we tend to just be on one side of the equation. And I always like to, you know, tell people on the team, like, t take off that hat and put yourself as a consumer. Like, why would you care about this product? Why would you care about this brand? And yeah, I think it's, you know, it's easy to want to shortcut to just the transaction, but building community and, you know, you're talking about the upper funnel, that's really important. And that, that mission, that personality, that becomes what distinguishes you from the other competitors. And, you know, it takes, it definitely takes some cultivating and some nurturing, but it's so worth it. Like you cannot, again, Mithu has a community of, you know, 13 million followers across our different platforms and our different brands. And we're starting to evolve those. And, um, that that's irreplaceable like it's you cannot buy that we engage with these people every single day and they tell us immediately what they like they don't like they you know they'll call BS on the things that that they don't agree with they're very very vocal and that's like the you know the beauty and the curse of social media is you get that immediate feedback we are no longer in a one-way dialogue of like TV commercials that just get fed to an audience and they have to take it, you know, they will respond, so. So let's transition then to um, thinking about why is then identity, you know, we, we touched on it a little bit, but is why is identity such a powerful motivator? Like in your experience, and, and perhaps it's with Me Too or even other brands that may have done it well, you know, an example of why, how is it so influential and, and why is it? Well, I think it's, it's, an emotional trigger, right? I think it's um, it's validating to feel seen and understood as a complete person, um, and I, you know, I think anyone would agree that they want that, and there's a satisfaction in that. So, um, identity is, you know, again, it's that nuance that 
you don't get by just saying, you know, buy something. It's why are you going to give your loyalty to a brand? There's many, many reasons. Of course, function, value. There's some practical reasons, but there's also the emotional reason of why. Why do you want to support a minority owned business or a local owned business? Like there's an affinity there. And I think, you know, especially for, I think, communities of color, um, you know, it's also just a moment of feeling validated, like where, you know, I, I don't want to get too deep, but, you know, there's so much history of feeling like we didn't exist or that, you know, we've been sort of sidelined and it's it's incredibly empowering to feel seen and to feel like you can bring your entire self and that your community is being represented and celebrated in a respectful manner and also and also just seeing, you know, like, I think we're the Latino community is also and like black culture is also just all about celebrating the excellence that we see like when one of us succeeds everybody succeeds like we all feel like it's a triumph for the community and that you know that is important that is what having identity woven into marketing does so I, and I think it's a good example if you look at it cross culturally right and you think of every even outside of just the Hispanic market like you just mentioned right with within the black community as well you know I was losing my mind you know, screaming at the television for TFO and, and Serena to win, right, at the U.S. Open. Because when, when they win, I feel that I won. It's a, it's, a, it's a translation of that. So, you know, we got lucky this year. We had a 19-year-old you know, Spaniard. This guy is going to be unbelievable over the next decade. But, you know, so we got lucky. We had, you know, we had a, a second, you know, second bite at the apple. But the idea is that there is something about um, triggering that innate, part, that emotional trigger inside of a consumer base, and that's irrespective of whether or not they're ethnic or not. I think it's the same thing, like if um, I had a, uh, an example that I gave yesterday about, um, I had to go to North Carolina, and the example that I gave was, uh, in North Carolina, I was looking, I was shooting content, and I had to look for um, barbecue, like pit, the best barbecue in North Carolina. And I came across two guys that were really good friends, they happened to be staying at the same hotel that I was at, and over breakfast, um, I asked them, I said, hey, where could I go to find some really good barbecue? I had no idea that barbecue in North Carolina is like religion. It is religion. And they literally almost came to blows because one of them believed that it's apparently there's Eastern vinegar based and then there's like Western uh, tomato based. I had no idea. I figured it was just barbecue. These guys they were arguing and fighting enough that I had to apologize to them and tell them, look, guys, I'm really sorry. Like, I was going to buy their breakfast because they literally were going to fight. And one of them was like, nah, he's always wrong. It's just that he always thinks he's right. <laughs> and, that, and they left the kitchen. They left the, the dining area, you know what I mean? Like, ready to come to fight. In them, if I, and they were too, and again, they were, it was, it was two brothers that were, they were arguing about this. But they could have been anybody. They could have been aliens. But the thing that triggered them was the emotional tie that they had to barbecue. And I, I like to highlight that story because I think it's a way for you to be able to think about your product, your brand, your company, and what is the mechanism. There's got to be something more than right transactional that's actually going to inspire and really trigger people. And in your communications, what you're really trying to tap into is that thing. That's the thing you want to put your finger on and sort of tap because that's what's going to get your consumer base to drive yeah. community. And that's a good point that culture is not, we tend to liken it just to, you know, identity and like, you know, culture, like ethnic culture, but it's not just that culture because it's right. motherhood, it's sports fandom, it's all these other affinities that, you know, we're all comprised of many intersections of those cultures that we belong to and that we're passionate about. Um, it's, it's not singular. So again, and you know, we deal with this all the time in, you know, Hispanic or Latino marketing where it's like, they're like, yeah, Latinos are passionate about food, family, and soccer. And I'm like, okay, can, like, can we move beyond that? Like, we're more than that. It's not, you know, it's like, yes, most people are, if that's probably true for most, but try a little harder, go a little deeper, you know? So. Yeah, that, you know, another, you know, interesting example that's a more recent one is, and I, I forgot his name, I don't know the actual, Title of it, but the but the guy skateboarding right in L.A. Mm -hmm. for Ocean Spray that Ocean oh, Spray one yeah, yeah. right and so that's a really that was a that's a brilliant example of how cross culturalism works mm -hmm. and it's and really what it had nothing to do with ethnicity it had everything to do with freedom mm -hmm. right just like that delight and the elation of 
movement of being in a state of bliss and not having a care in the world, right? In the middle of the pandemic, this guy's just skateboarding around you know, LA and drinking some ocean spray. And then it became a commercial and everything else after that, but I think it's a, it was a really good example of the cross-cultural impact, right? The cross-cultural appeal that that had. So let's talk a little bit then about what is Me Too's then ambition? What's its, what's its true mission? What are you trying to do now as Chief Brand Officer and looking forward? Yeah, so along those lines, um, really the, the plan is to build a portfolio of brands. And so uh, our flagship brand, which we call Wham, because the handle is We Are Me Too, um, and Somos, those are kind of the, the main brands. Um, you know, they've, they're everything about culture, nostalgia, comedy, they're very lighthearted, um, and those will continue to exist that way, right? There's always sort of that comfort in nostalgia and in our upbringing, we like to say it should feel like that primo, like that cousin at your get together that just like, it, like it just feels like home, it's comforting. Um, Fierce launched in 2017, and that is like our female empowerment brand. We relate to all of our brands to, um, we can probably go to the next slide that kind of d demonstrates like, um, you know, we, we relate them as like, let's say like relatives in a family. And so, you know, Fierce is like your woke cousin, female cousin who went to college, has all the answers, you absolutely look up to her. Um, so that's been around for a long time. Crema launched last year, that is our music vertical. Um, Things That Matter launched earlier this year, and Things That Matter was sort of interesting how it came to be because it used to be a vertical within Me Too, um, in our editorial space. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of very serious topics we need to cover that affect the community, policy, immigration, but it felt really at odds alongside, you know, the means. And so we were like, you know, our audience doesn't know if they're going to get a, like a really tragic news story or like a funny meme. And so we decided we needed to separate those and allow things that matter to have its own runway to really be a resource and a destination for the community. Um, there's a lot we want to do with that brand. And then... Um, we recently merged with NGL, our parent company acquired NGL and merged them into Meet Thu, and so they come with a couple of owned and operated brands as well, Hispanic Kitchen, Latina Moms, um, and they have the event space called Hispanicize, so we will be adopting all of that. So the goal is a portfolio of brands, again, because we're not a monolith. You know, we've talked about standing up a parenting vertical, um, a gaming vertical, or kind of like that whole nerd culture that Latinos are absolutely present in as well. And so there's a lot of ideas um, that we have on the table, but it's really about having that portfolio of brands that we are going to start bringing, you know, to real life and events as well. Um, yeah. And the full, the full mm -hmm. So you've got, there's a lot on tap. <laughs> Do you need any help? Is that <laughs> Always. <laughs> There's never enough bodies, never enough hours. Um, yeah, how many of you actually have heard of Hispanicize? We were just talking mm -hmm. about so I'm just curious. How many of you have heard of Hispanicize? Yeah, there's also, um, I believe there's Latinx Connect, mm -hmm. Latino Connect, and there's a couple mm -hmm. of others that are out there. Um, NGL, I believe, had John Legazama as one of the partners that was yeah, part of the Yeah, he's one of the co-founders. Mm -hmm. He's one of the co-founders of it, so that will probably ring a bell for some folks. Mm -hmm. um, Let's talk about then recommendations as we get towards the end of this conversation here, which is um, what do you recommend um, for founders? Like if you have a startup, right, and they're looking to build out, how can they look to leverage or use, you know, pivot or build, you know, integrate identity and cultural branding as part of their, their startup sort of communications or marketing plans? I mean, I think the research is first, obviously understanding what the potential is there, but also, and also, you know, what is the competitive space and the landscape? There's some basic things like that. Um, I also think that, especially when you're building a company around culture, um, hiring and surrounding yourself with a team that brings that authenticity and brings that perspective. You know, our team is like 95% Latino. You know, there's there's the folks here and there that are not, um, and they're absolutely instrumental to what we do. But, you know, we, we just really challenge ourselves to hire within that community because that diversity of perspective and the authenticity, like you, you can't train that, you can't teach that. Um, 
you know, we, if, if Me Too gets criticized for anything, it's maybe that we're very Mexican leaning, we're very LA and West Coast leaning. And, you know, that that's the history, that's our, our origin. You know, Bea is, is from Tijuana, and so that's, you know, in our DNA, but we try to be very conscientious about hiring, you know, especially now that everybody's working remote. Um, geographically diverse and also background diverse and so wanting uh, again Latinos are not a monolith and we come from many many backgrounds and many countries are represented in that and so making sure that we have that diversity you know even within a cultural company we have to challenge ourselves to have a diversity of perspective um, and I think that's that's the principal thing now what do you recommend that people don't do <laughs> uh, probably stretch yourself too thin i think it's and that's that's a i know that seems really obvious but i think um you know one philosophy we were talking about earlier that i i've really come to embrace from our new ownership at go digital is this idea of fail fast and iterate and so um try new things don't be afraid but recognize when it's also not working and when it's time to move on because you can funnel just endless energy and resources and money into something and absolutely everything is worth experimenting and trying because that's how you innovate that's how you will come upon the thing that you never thought was going to take off um, but also recognize when it's time to sort of cut it loose because again when you dilute those resources and that energy across you know 25 different projects you're really the reality is you're not doing any of them well so realize where you need to focus your energies so um, I've got one. Don't be a culture vulture. That's the key. I mean, that's, that's a good one. <laughs> that's exactly. So yeah. culture vultures, for those of you that don't, it's the term that we use in the industry that's more about, you know, brands that try to come in and, and deliver what they may seem as authentic, but really isn't. And they're coming in for a commerce buy. You know what I mean? They're coming in for just um, claiming something to just incrementally sell, but they're really not there to invest in the community and into building. Um, you're seeing a lot of that in Web3 right now. You're seeing a lot of that in crypto. Um, where, remember, culture vulture, culture has been deemed an ethnic term, but it is not. If you're into Web3 or NFT, in the NFT space or crypto spaces, that's a culture to itself. And there are a lot of people that are coming into that space that are saying, yeah, we're all about the community, but they're really not. And so they're pillaging, they're, right? They're coming through. So that's where the term culture vulture comes in. Uh, don't be one, okay? Um, yeah. Any other, uh, one interesting fact I think I'd like to touch on, if you don't mind, because there's a lot of um, women in the audience. I think, I think you have a great perspective about being a Latina and actually the come up and what it took to actually be where you are now. Any guidance or any advice that you have to any of the women that are in the audience? To, it, this is a hard space. Mm -hmm. she's, not, she's really nice. I mean, this is a brutal space. Media is, is a very difficult space to play in, and let alone technology. So I, I just think it'd be interesting for people to have your perspective. I mean, I think the thing most recently that probably resonates for me is you can't do it all at the same time. And so you pick and choose. Again, it, it goes back to the same thing of where you're going to put your resources. Um, I, you know, for me personally speaking, I am also a mother, I have two kids, and you know, what allows me, I think, to, to thrive in this is a really supportive partner and, um, and supportive leadership as well that has, you know, given me the space to be very vocal, to sort of be my entire self, um, and, and learn from it and really have provided, I think, mentorship that I needed um, in terms of, you know, okay, how do I fit into this business space? How do I think and speak like them and, and play into the triggers that matter in a business space? Um, but also still bringing my entire self. Uh, again, I, like, I cannot divorce the fact that I am Latina, that, you know, both my parents are from Mexico, that I have two kids, that, like, that is my entire self, and I think more than anything, just, I, I'm grateful for the opportunity to bring my entire self, um, but know that you can't do it all at the same time. There are definitely days that I do a better job at my job job than I do at my motherhood job, and, um, 
And then sometimes when that requires more attention, I'm ignoring the job. And I think it's a myth to tell women that, you know, you, you can do it all. Yes, you can do it all, but not at the same time. I think it was RGB that said that. It's like you kind of just, you know, it, it, you've got to pick two of the three or one of the three. And it always feels disbalanced. But the big picture, the macro, is that you are handling all of it. But there's days you're going to feel better at, at portions of it than others. It's very true. I think you pick two of the three. So if it was, if you had choices, school, work, right, and life, you're going to suck at one of them. And each week, you got to pick and choose which is the one you want to suck on, right, the most. <laughs> and that's the week that it just, unfortunately, is going to take a hit. You can't master it all. Um, I'd like to open it up for any questions. Does anybody have any questions from the audience? Sure. So, uh, Can you speak? So uh, from a entrepreneurship perspective, uh, events like these kind of fail to attract or get into um, Latin communities, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, uh, minority groups don't tend to reinvest in each other, and yet uh, the Latin community is a massive economic force. Uh, the, the BIPOC community uh, is a massive economic force. But we're not inspiring the next generation of entrepreneurs and getting them out to events where they can tap into resources and, and become part of the community. From a marketing perspective and from a media perspective, you guys are doing an amazing job. But, but how do we inspire more people to uh, either how do we reach them in their communities or how do we uh, inspire people and, and welcome them into the startup ecosystem better? Because we talked yeah, about we did. Yeah, right. <laughs> so uh, I want to tap this real, real quick. So two point, two quick points. One is that's what actually I became a founder uh, track co-chair this year because of that problem. So number one, participate, right? So and I think rather than and I love this piece. Like as a startup founder, I think you're you're absolutely dead right about we have a tendency to not support each other. It's the crabs in a bucket mentality, right? And it, it's very true. If you're ethnic and you're trying to do something, why is it that people come to you and think that they can get a discount when they should be buying full price to support you? Yeah. That should be the reverse of the model that we, that we apply. So if, you're, if you have, for you, all of you founders that are doing something, do not discount your stuff for your friends. Your friends should be paying full rate because they should be willing to see you succeed and that's how you'll succeed. The second piece, right, is participate. Don't sit on the sideline. Like, get involved. And that's why I thank God for, like, Olivia over in the back. Because she was like, yeah, like, once I spoke to her, I was convinced that it, this was something that we had to invest in to be able to do. And I'd like to ask, the, is the group here on the right, are you guys part of a group um, that came in? You guys did, right? So I think more of that, where um, we need to be assertive people that are in leadership positions to being able to reach out to communities and drag everybody kicking and screaming, right, to, be, to being able to do it. So I do think that it's a multifaceted problem. Um, I, just to speak on behalf of just Denver Startup Week, I do think they've made strides. Olivia has been part of this group for almost six years now, right, reaching seven, um, and really trying to take greater strides to do it. I do think there's a lot more work ahead I don't think that we're anywhere close to what we want it to be, but I do think that this is a beginning to do it, but I'll let yeah. you. Yeah, and I think, you know, for our side, what is exciting and, you know, why we launched and branched off things that matter is to provide that platform because, again, that's where we welcome and wanting to have a space that we can curate, like, here's where you can find out about scholarships and grants, and if you're a small business owner, um, as a platform, we already promote small business owners, creators that are doing this good work in the community, you know, whether they are just someone who's kind of blown up on TikTok by giving, you know, financial advice or mental health advice, like um, we, we are that as a plat, like that is ingrained in our mission is that we will always be a platform to amplify those voices and so that our community can discover other people to support. But you're absolutely right. Like I think that there is a shift in certain things that need to change. And I think, yeah, we shouldn't be discounting ourselves. Like even at Meet Thu, you know, we get 
brands and advertisers are like, well, you know, want to give us the, the leftover budgets. And I'm like, no, it's a $50,000 minimum. Like I know, you know, I know these big brands have the budget. Why would it be cheaper to advertise and reach our community? Like if you want it and there's value there, invest in it. Um, and that is true. I, I absolutely agree that if you're creating an event, um, I know, you know, Ana Flores from We All Grow, same thing. She was like, don't ask me for free tickets, like buy tickets and support the event. And we should be doing that. Um, but you're right, you do make a good point. You made me think about in the entertainment space, you know, I also, just my observation, and it may be a, a controversial, you know, opinion, but the idea that, you know, these Latino projects and, and movies that are getting made, like in the Heights, got criticism because, you know, it wasn't diverse enough. And I can recognize that, but I also, like, it pains me when we sort of tear down our own community, because, like, one film is not supposed to be everything to everyone. And if we don't support the few things that are getting green lit, there will be no more. Like, if we just tear ourselves down from the inside out, there will be nothing else to get green lit. We need more and more projects green lit, and we need to support all of them so that more of them can, can come to fruition and they are commercially viable. To take the win. You know what I mean? Take the win. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. So, I mean, but, uh, so what I tell people is never. So what I tell people is demographics determine destiny. So if you look at me and Joseph here and you, this is what the new face of the majority is looking like. What I tell people is like you got a choice: either invest now and be nice, or when we're in a different position and you're not, it may not. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm tired of being completely nice and politically correct. It's like, ignore us at your own fault. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not an option anymore. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So um, a little earlier you made a, a comment that um, coming from your identity that you're able to make cultural jokes that others couldn't, you know, just wouldn't come across the same way. So um, keying off of that, I'm wondering, are there other specific things in, in the specifics of your content or the way that you present it that are uniquely tied to your identity that other groups don't have? Like, I mean, there's a gazillion mom groups out there and there's a gazillion cooking groups out there. Like, what's so specific to your identity that differentiates your brands from, the, from all the other ones on the market? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yes, there are things that, again, so one of the early, you know, well-known series, it's probably one of the things that Mithu's most known for is like the Cholos content, right? And so they started these series called Cholos Try, um, and it was really seeing them in these unexpected lights, right? So they're like, try kale chips and kombucha, or, you know, try yoga, or try these things that are pretty unexpected. And really, you know, one distinction we've always made about that series is like, it is not about poking fun at Cholos, it's that as Latinos, we probably do all have somebody in the family that looks like that or somebody that we knew. And the thing is that they are, they are real and full people. They are not caricatures the way that, you know, they would be if, if cast in a mainstream entertainment property. And so for us, it has never, it's really been about changing minds about what a cholo is. It's like they're not these scary, like evil people. They are real people. They are down to earth. They are lovable. They're playful. They're like, they're everything. They're dads. They're like, we show them in their full, full light. And that is something that, you know, there's a reason why that has become such a mega hit, you know, series. And like, we still get asked for it all the time, even like, you know, brands and people are like, are you guys gonna do more Cholos Try content or more Cholos content? Like, and you know, they have their own franchise now where they, they do their own content. And it really is about changing minds. It's about saying like, you're looking at us from the outside in and you have some preconceptions and let us change your mind and tell you what it really is like on this side and it go, that's where it goes back to like there is a space for everything and for a diversity of content like we are more than food family and soccer like let's go a little deeper let us show you all the nuances that belong in our culture because you know like every culture we're incredibly multifaceted we have a lot of passions and a lot of diversity and we want to showcase all of it and so that's really um, that's really the work we do yeah there's a really good point that you're bringing up that 
we, we didn't dive into too much here, but I think a big piece of it is with social media, social media is splintering um, groups even even more so, right? So there's a really good clip in that video that unfortunately we, we had to clip it out, but there was, if you think of, there's, a, there's this one Latino in the, in the film that actually, in the, the intro video that actually talks about how he's like, he's Latino, he's trans, right? He's, uh, he's a creative spirit. Those are, it may be splintering and harder to reach him, but now I have three more opportunities to be able to tap into someone like that, right? If I've got a product, right? Or if I have a brand. And I think, I think too often we make, you know, it's, it is a challenge, right? Social is splintering people across many different identities. But if you ask me, like I just took up a couple of weeks ago shoe cobbling. You know what I mean? Like I design shoes now. And that's just my thing. And I didn't know that I was going to love it, but now I do. But now all of a sudden, you can't only talk to me as a, as, yeah, you can talk to me as a creative soul, but if you talk to me as a cobbler, as someone who designs shoes, now you really have my attention, right? So, and that only came to be because of social and what I, what I discovered and, you know, went out and actually took courses to actually learn how to design shoes. So, um, th I think that's part of the challenge. I think it's the way in which the market is now developing and evolving is splintering even further which is a challenge, but the opportunity lies in that now you have more times at bat to being able to actually target and attract, right, and, and build community around. So it is, it's, a, it's a great question that you're bringing up. Um, yeah, and I'll just add also, like, it, it is a constant challenge that even we have to do. So Fierce has, you know, it's a very crowded space in the Latina digital space, right? You have Our Somos, you have We All Grow, um, there, there's Hip Latina, there's so many sort of counterparts and, you know, we believe there's room for all of us, but I am constantly challenging the team, like, don't just be an echo chamber, don't just repost, you know, we all repost and share content from other creators, but what is that unique thing? And so when you talk about like, yes, there's a lot of food outlets out there and there's a lot of mom outlets out there, what is, what is going to be the signature difference? And it's a constant skill that you have to remind yourself of, especially when you're creating content, you know, posting multiple times a day, it's easy to kind of fall into a rut. But, um, you know, that is something that we really want to tackle. Like there isn't really a very raw and real approach to mother like if I look at something like a scary mommy there isn't something like that in the Latino space right so kind of like let's let's put aside all like you know the pretty butterflies and flowers like motherhood is not like it's messy and it's hard and it's frustrating and it's rewarding and it's like beautiful and it's all of those things together like how can we start to tackle it more realistically and then you add the layer of culture to that which is like we are contending with you know what we were raised with our moms telling us you know like yeah you should pierce your baby's ears as soon as they come out of the womb you should do this you should do that and like trying to also forge our own paths like well do I really want to continue that or do I want to make my own decisions not to mention if then you're in an interracial marriage and then there's opposing you know ideas about how you're going to handle that and kind of go against your family norms, like there, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, so that, that's going to be the approach we take. Any other questions? Anybody else? Um, I see that it's like really big on Hispanics and stuff, but do you like try to connect with people outside of your culture, especially with the mother thing, like other type of mothers? Or Yeah, Fierce especially has always been about uh, you know, being a community for all women of color um, and anyone who identifies, you know, as femme. And so it, it has always been very inclusive. And there is actually, um, so it's another thing we cut out of, you know, showing you guys one of our really recent hits was um, a video that we did with Joe Coy. And it was, you know, trying like Mexican desserts and Filipino desserts and just sort of bringing those, you know, like there's similarities and there's differences. Um, and I think, you know, we we like to do it in an organic way, which is to say that we absolutely do, you know, interface with other cultures and we want to appeal. And I think that there is resonance there. Um, we are, you know, we do say we're very committed to the Latino space and not for it to be exclusive, but that is sort of our primary focus. But absolutely, there's a lot of intersectionality with other cultures. So, yeah, in the back. Uh, 
Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we're, again, we're challenging ourselves to think about what was fascinating about that video with Joe Coy is that, you know, it took off on YouTube in a way that we hadn't seen really any of our other content perform. And all the comments and all the traction and all the love was coming from the Filipino community, not from the Latino community. So we were kind of like, okay, this is super interesting. And in part, you know, in part, it's probably that there's probably even less content and less instances in which they feel their community and culture represented. And so here was a, a rare instance. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think we're now starting to really think of like, okay, what, what does this really look like in a, again, in an authentic way for us, right? And we look around like the fastest growing segment in this last census is like multicultural. It is people of multi-ethnic backgrounds. And so what what is that next phase look like for me too, which is, yeah, not an insular experience about, oh, as Latinos, like one Latino to another, but maybe Latinos, and we are marrying other races and other cultures. And so what does that look like to bring, you know, bring up our kids in this intersectionality and make it really, really welcoming, have space and dialogue and representation for all of it. So I think that's going to be our future challenge for sure. Last question. Speaking on identity uh, and in the entrepreneurial space, uh, how do we bridge the, the, the polarity of the identity? So it seems to be like uh, Hispanics and, and uh, blacks on film and even in the entrepreneurial space. If I were to show up with a ranchero button-up shirt and a cowboy hat to a pitch event, I'm immediately polarized. If I'm sagging my pants, I'm immediately polarized. How do we balance whitewashing and trying to fit in with staying true to identity and striking that middle ground, especially in the entrepreneurial space? Yeah, we just, we, we had an extensive, Marcus is gonna solve it all. <laughs> um, so uh, let me give you the context. I've got like two minutes here before we gotta wrap this up. Uh, I got a minute here, so I'm gonna try to do this quick. So when I relocated here, I was born and raised out of New York. I was a, I'm a Brooklyn-born Puerto Rican kid, right? And so um, when I came out to Colorado, uh, I, I was the only, I was one of two Hispanics in a 150-person firm that when I was working uh, late one night, and I was a creative director at that point, when I was working late one night, I had just gotten to Colorado, and I was about maybe six, four to six weeks into the job, um, there was an account manager that actually had saw the light on and thought that I was the help. And she thought that I was there to clean trash and said to me, hey, would you mind just dumping the trash you know, before you leave tonight? And about three days later, so um, show up at a meeting and I'm sitting in the meeting and she walks in. And her mouth, she turned green, she was gonna puke because she didn't realize that the, the account that she's working on, I was now the new creative director that had to drive that business. And that was, um, now I could have jumped out and I could have been, right, the most insane, irate person. Look, I'm from Brooklyn. Like, like you just don't want to go there, right? But, but I didn't and I learned that it takes calibration because change happens in micro, micro moments. It doesn't happen, it happens in inches. Um, not in feet, not in yards. We want it to go that fast, but it doesn't. And that was a real true growth moment for both her and I, because I became a better leader after that. Um, and I think the, the learning lesson that I learned from that was, because I used to blare my music in my office. I had, Daddy Yankee was playing, just blaring out a big ass Puerto Rican flag in my office. Like people were afraid to come into my office. Right, they were because you gotta understand, right? These are people that were born in Westminster. They're born in like Littleton. They're like, you know, they, they don't know what that is. They think a rodeo's rowdy. Go to my office, like you know what I mean. Like I had taco, t you know, it wasn't Taco Tuesdays. It was Tequila Mondays that I had in my office, right? So, it was it was it, the culture clashing is inevitable. That that will happen. I do think that the way to think about this is, and this has to do with the level of frame switching. I think. I think we have two generations that want 
you know, in a, perf in a perfect world, a boomer Gen X generation would tell these young people, you want to accelerate, you want to get, you know, better in life, put on a suit and go in and do this thing and, you know, dot your I's and cross your T's and speak correctly, right? Um, that is not how this new generation is. I have a 12 year old son and he can go from A to C without ever having to look at B. He's that bright. This whole generation is that bright. And I think it's going to take its behavioral. I think that you have an older generation that is in conflict because they want things to be a way that's how they got to success. But a new generation, that's not how they're going to get there. They're going to get there in their own way. And I think it's up to us that are in an older, you know, more wiser capacity is open the lane for them, block and tackle for them, let them, let them go, let them run. And if we can do that, I think we all get to the same place. So, but frame switching is a much deeper conversation, which is what I had to learn, that when I walk in a room, if I blare my music, I'm actually off-putting to other people. And I have to learn to center myself so that I, realizing that I was the small organism infecting a much bigger body, right? Not, I, people didn't have to accept me the way that I was. I actually had to make it palatable for people to be open to letting me be a part of their culture. And that's a two-way street. It's not just one way. So I'm sorry that's a long answer, but um, any last words? No, this was great. Thank you. Awesome. Please, Thank you. Warm, warm round. Thank you, Vanessa. Thanks for coming down. Bye.